Today we have a pleasure to have a Julian Sonner talk. He will tell us about signatures of a chaos and structure of eigenstates in gallography. Please, Julian, 45 minutes. Okay, hi, thank you, Irina. Um, hello, everybody. Thanks, everybody, for inviting me to talk here. Unfortunately, uh, remotely, I would, been much, would have much preferred to actually be there, but that's just how it is at the moment. Um, so, um, actually, a lot of the material that I'm talking about today, in fact, I have once presented even in Moscow physically, but there's some new stuff, um, even unpublished stuff. Um, and so, yes, I apologize for those who have seen that material, but it's still worth, you know, setting it up from the beginning. So, good. So, oops. Right. So, obviously, um, I'd like to start by giving you some context and, and motivate the work that we're doing here or that I'm presenting. Um, and then um, what I want to do is I want to essentially tell you of various different signatures of chaotic properties um, or of quantum chaos that are relevant to holography. Um, and I would like to tell you essentially um, in two different kind of models, lower dimensional models, namely SYK and, and uh, two-dimensional CFTs. And so this is roughly how my talk will be structured. So let's start with um, the introduction. So I'm clearly not the first speaker uh, also at this meeting who points out that uh, one of the interesting features of ADS-CFT is that it gives us a relation between uh, gravitational theory, um, most often in ADS, to a field theory, which is moreover in all the examples that we love and control well, a unitary field theory, and of course, often a conformal field theory, or at least related in the UV to a conformal field theory. And so the goal uh, of uh, this body of work, and actually also the goal, as I've noticed, of many of the other interesting talks that have been so far presented at this workshop, is to use this ADS-CFT duality to investigate uh, the physics, in particular, the quantum aspects of the physics of black holes. Now, um, as I already anticipated, I'm going to use mostly lower dimensional models. Okay, and so let me give a little bit uh, of a justification. So the major advantage is that um, recently there has been quite a lot of progress in a number of lower dimensional models. So in particular in this context of three-dimensional ADS and two-dimensional CFT, as well as the, the kind of models which I'm, uh, which I'm here indicating by SYK. So the, those are sort of near ADS2, near CFT2 type models. And um, those models actually lend themselves both to analytical and numerical control. Numerical control in particular, actually, these microscopic models here, these SYK type models. Um, and this, this uh, uh, amount of control leads to very interesting conceptual insights, namely that um, quantum chaos physics in the manifestation of RMT, that stands for random matrix theory, and ETH, which is the eigenstate normalization hypothesis, um, this gives us sort of uh, um, ideas um, you know, how bulk physics, um, you know, late time dynamics of black holes um, can be conceptualized. And now this is sort of explicitly realized in this model. So this is the advantage, okay? Then the disadvantage is of course that, well, there's two kinds of disadvantages. The first one is the most obvious one that we're not in flat space, which is where we mo would most like to be. Um, but um, we're also, um, in lower dimensions compared to the so physical dimensions that we're interested in. So um, those are two um, disadvantages one has to admit. But as you've learned also from, I'm sure, other speakers, um, many other speakers at this meeting, there are uh, analogous questions um, that one can, uh, one can address in these lower dimensions and in ADS, which are analogous to the sort of big questions that one would like to address in asymptotically flat space in physical dimensions. And so why is it that I want to talk about um, a quantum chaos, things like random matrices and things like eigenstate normalization? Well, the sort of mantra that this all comes from is the fact that within ADS-CFT, uh, the physics of thermalization 
Uh, so the physics of a system that starts out of equilibrium and finally reaches some thermal equilibrium state is the physics of black hole formation and if you wait long enough also evaporation. Okay, so um, now let me say a few words about the classes of models um, that uh, I'd like to, uh, to utilize. So the first will be um, this idea of using three-dimensional ADS, which is dual to two-dimensional CFT at a large central charge, okay? But of course, one needs to supply the fact that there's a large central charge. The large central charge is basically giving us the semi-classical type limit. So there's a semi-classical bulk description, but one needs to say more. And in particular, this can't be just any large central charge CFT, but it has to be one that you know, has recently been referred to as sort of a sparse spectrum uh, large CCFT, meaning that there is a sparse, sparse spectrum of uh, light operators uh, in the CFT. And in such theories, there is basically an object that one can identify, which um, encodes notions of classical gravity, namely what is known as the Virasoro identity block. Um, so in this Virasoro identity block, we have an object which allows us to extract classical or semi-classical gravity answers from the CFT, um, but which also allows us to uh, um, understand the corrections that it receives perturbatively and non-perturbatively in this parameter. So let's say the small parameter is one over the central charge. And this means that these are corrections that are both perturbative and non-perturbative in the Newton constant in the semi-classical bulk. So that's one class of models that we're going to use. And then um, we're going to use the other class of models, which um, I'm calling here sort of NADS2, NCFT1. So these are nearly two dimensional ADS and nearly one dimensional CFTs, where um, the canonical model of course is this SYK model um, or similar disorder theories. And also here there is a semi-classical parameter um, this semi-classical parameter I'm calling here in inverted commas large NSYK. So there's a large number of sites, but we should sort of think of this as simply um, the log of the dimension of the Hilbert space of this quantum system. Um, these are examples of maximally chaotic quantum systems, which are governed by something that is very similar in the infrared to what I call the Virasoro identity block here. And so this is essentially the physics of um, diff S1 mod SL2, uh, which uh, has received the name of the universal Schwarzian sector. So there is some universal sector also in the infrared of these theories, which is like um, something like a gravitational sector. And we can extract those answers and we can see how they are corrected um, at subleading orders. So those are the two kind of models and I actually will also uh, uh, point out commonalities both in the mathematical structure and also in the physical interpretation um, between these two classes of models as I go on. Okay, so now um, the other uh, um, important part of setting the scene is essentially um, some preliminary words on chaotic notions, chaotic dynamics and other ways of talking about chaos in classical and quantum systems. So as we all know, uh, classical chaos uh, is, I mean, usefully uh, characterized by the sensitivity to initial conditions. So the famous idea that, of course, if you follow two nearby trajectories in phase space, um, that if you change the initial condition just a little bit, uh, you can express this, of course, through the Poisson bracket, uh, then uh, these two uh, phase space trajectories diverge exponentially with a characteristic exponent which is um, given the name of Lyapunov. Now, um, two other uh, famous Russian physicists, so Larkin and Ovchinikov, already in the late 60s, uh, took this as an inspiration to try and find some quantum manifestation of this sensitivity to initial conditions. And what they proposed was that we um, think of the Poisson bracket as a semi-classical um, avatar of the commutator of two operators and we study essentially the expectation value of the commutator squared of two operators with respect to the thermal ensemble at temperature beta. And um, this uh, basically gives us also um, 
in the semi-classical case, uh, a way of extracting something like a Lyapunov exponent from a quantum system. Now, uh, in recent years, of course, as you are well aware, this has received a lot of attention um, and it has re received a lot of attention also uh, in the context of holography. Now, what people have focused on more rather than strictly just this notion of the commutator squared is um, just a component this commutator squared has four terms. So a particular kind of term that you find, furthermore abstracted to two general operators, not just um, the say position and the momentum, but let's say two operators V and W. And what is important is that this exponential growth or depending on what you um, focus on could also be an exponential decrease um, of the, this correlation function is basically encapsulated in the contribution where the operators are out of time order. So where I start at zero, I go to T, I go back to zero and I go to T. And this is the out of time order correlation function. Um, and um, well, as has been studied, for example, by these authors here. Um, what I wanted to make uh, say here that a remark here is that sort of uh, conceptually <clears throat> what this encapsulates, this kind of quantity is the growth of operators uh, on the Heisenberg evolution in chaotic systems to be uh, quantified in a more precise way later. Okay, so, but this is um, what I would say a manifestation of dynamical chaos in the quantum regime. But in actual fact, um, in quantum physics, people typically call, talk about other notions of chaos. And so other notions of chaos are actually more related to the spectral correlations of a system. And uh, in this context, I want to introduce another uh, set of ideas, which basically go uh, under the name of eigenstate thermalization. So as we just um, kind of hinted at, uh, classical thermalization has to do with the, um, you know, efficient exploration of the phase space due to chaotic properties and ergodicity. Whereas quantum thermalization is usually understood more in terms of spectral properties. And so one way of understanding is that, um, well, let us assume that um, a quantum system has the property that uh, its eigenstates, so eigenstates of simple operators O, M and N eigenstates, themselves actually take a specific form. Namely that on the diagonal, I have some smooth function um, of the average energy and that is corrected as well on as well as off the diagonal by something that is exponentially small in the microcanonical entropy of the system. So S of E is the microcanonical entropy at the average energy E. RMN is a random matrix which is defined to be of mean um, zero and variance one. And F is just one, not another smooth function which uh, depends smoothly on the arguments. So basically E the average energy and omega the difference of energies. And if this is the case, so this, this form is known as the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. This is the form, the matrix elements statistically take this form, then a generic excited states will actually thermalize. So um, if you look at the expectation value in some generic excited state psi of some operator, then um, this will actually go to the thermal value, which is here on the diagonal, plus some exponentially small corrections, but what I want to highlight is that the mechanism of thermalization here is seemingly very different from what we said in the classical system, because what happens is that the thermal information has always been there here on the diagonal. All that happens is that because of the quantum dynamics, these phases that are basically due to the chaotic energy spacings of energy levels, they basically uh, average out and we're only left with the diagonal part of this correlation function, which is thermal because it is thermal um, in every single and um, finitely excited eigenstate. So dephasing basically reveals thermality in a quantum system, which is a very different uh, view of thermalization than you have in classical systems. And so this difference is what I'm commenting on here, um, namely um, that, uh, so these two, um, let's say paradigms, so the eigenstate thermalization in some sense is a modern take on spectral chaos um, in the sense of Wigner and Dyson, meaning that it has to do with statistical properties of the spectrum. Okay. Um, 
random matrix theory can be seen as sort of the canonical example of a system satisfying ETH. Um, this, well, we can skip this comment, but basically this is in distinction to an integrable model, which is very different kind of uh, spectral statistics, namely Poissonian, and of course it doesn't thermalize. But what I want to emphasize more here is that this kind of uh, notion um, um, refers to very late time physics. Okay, so really, in strictly speaking, if you let time go to infinity, or more physically, if time is, um, let's say, past what I would call the Thales time, so which, which in the models that we're discussing here is like times of order e to the n. Whereas this Lyapunov or butterfly type chaos, so that has a relevant time scale. Let me first say something about the time scale, which is much, much smaller. So this is the scrambling time, which is logarithmic in this parameter n, so much, much shorter. And another um, obvious distinction between these two is that um, this uh, is some sort of semi-classical notion really of chaos. It makes connection even to the classical Lyapunov uh, sense of the chaos, but it needs also to be really strictly defined a semi-classical parameter, whereas there's no such need for a semi-classical parameter um, in this, uh, say, say, spectral notion of chaos. And so a priori, these two notions of chaos are completely unrelated, um, but okay, let's continue with um, um, toward our actual systems, unless there are some questions now. So this was my um, introduction to give some context and motivation. Okay, so now um, <clears throat> then let's move on. So let's look at um, the situation in these uh, lower dimensional toy models of holography. Okay, so yes, I want to treat them in some sense as holographic lampposts. I want to uh, see, um, because we have more control, I want to see, um, you know, how are these scenarios realized and um, what can we say more about um, how they play a role in holography? So um, the simplest model, let me just introduce it for the sake of completeness. I like to refer to it as a holographer's guinea pig. It's the simplest model system that we can use to study uh, holography on, as this SYK model, which is, as is well known to almost all of you, I'm sure, is a random disorder model, which is characterized by random all-to-all -all couplings. So you have some system of sites here uh, and you couple them in pairs to each other where this pair coupling JIJ KL is drawn from a random Gaussian distribution, which itself has mean zero and has a variance, which the variance here J squared, we should think of as really the coupling strength of the model, um, which we can tune, you know, this defines the distribution that we sample from. Um, what's wonderful about these models uh, is that they are actually solvable, both uh, analytically in a large n sense um, and numerically at finite n, where you can solve them uh, um, for you know, moderate, moderately large sizes of the Hilbert space using exact diagonalization. And of course, as um, I already hinted, um, in, the in the strict infrared of this at large n, this, this, con this includes a sort of version of a gravity sector, which is the Schwarzian sector. Okay, so let's actually go to numerics and let's let's do those numerics on those kinds of systems. So um, what we do is we take um, this system and we put the Hamiltonian or the these this ensemble of Hamiltonians um, on a computer and we just complete compute exactly the spectrum, and we then perform statistical analyses on the spectrum in order to. Um, make some statement about whether this ETH ansatz is correct um, in the SYK model. And so this is some work uh, a few years ago that I did together with Manuel Vielma in Geneva. So um, what I'm showing here is essentially two plots that uh, illustrate um, how things work. So here on the left hand side, this is just a pl plot directly of the matrix element. And we see that they are, so let's choose some operator you have to always choose some operator. And what we choose here is the occupation number on some given site K. So we take some site K and we measure its occupation. We find that indeed um, the uh, pre most, uh, uh, the, 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 um, the matrix of the operator O is almost vanishing at, unless you're on the diagonal. And off the diagonal, you can make some 
um, more precise analysis, you basically have um, almost Gaussian noise of order e to the minus s over two. Uh, then you can of course go and you can look at what is the behavior, this O of e as a function of e along the diagonal, um, and you get plots like you have here on the right hand side, where you see indeed that as you increase the Hilbert space, this converges to a smooth function of the average energy. Okay, and you can also, if you want, compare it to the microcanonical answer and you actually find agreement. But the more important bit is that um, as you increase the Hilbert space size, it actually numerically converges to a smooth function, which is basically an indication that um, the system um, satisfies this, this answer here. Um, okay, we also uh, looked numerically for uh, what's called Taulis physics, and we found uh, basically evidence that there is Taulis physics taking place, but let's not go into it. I don't have a plot for this either. So um, what I want to go to is like um, now some notions which will occupy us more um, as this talk goes on. Basically, let's look at scrambling, and in particular, let's look at what happens to this out of time order correlation function now uh, measured in a particular eigenstate. Okay, so the idea is that, well, if the system has eigenstates that somehow um, behave thermally, why not ask what happens to this OTOC, uh, so this out of time order correlation function in a thermal state, uh, in, in, sorry, excuse me, in an eigenstate rather than a thermal state. And um, what we find here uh, numerically is that we uh, find a complete um, um, agreement of the thermal result to the eigenstate result. And I just want to make here this numerical observation. We will later on analytically establish uh, actually that, these kind of, that this kind of physics is taking place. But so from these numerics, what I want to basically record is that um, there is some, somehow a Lyapunov exponent in eigenstates, okay, which takes the form Lyap Lyapunov exponent in the eigenstate is two pi over the temperature that we associate with that eigenstate. Okay, so that's a, that's sort of a takeaway message from this. Um, just because um, I wanted to um, like show you some new results, let me just say um, another measure of um, um, let's say scrambling dynamics that is related to operator growth, which is also you know this OTOC basically. I mean that's what the OTOC measures. So generally speaking, what one says that this OTOC measures is basically the growth of the Heisenberg operator, like how large does the operator O become if I evolve it in the Heisenberg picture. So in some sense, if I add successive commutators with the Hamiltonian. And of course, the size of the operator measured in um, some, some canonical basis for size is um, uh, related to what we call the complexity of the operator. And so a particularly nice measure uh, in these models is what is known as the Krylov complexity. So, and what one does is one actually just defines a canonical basis, um, which consists of taking some reference operator O. So for example, that could be our, uh, on, our on-site occupation, or it could be some hopping operator, whatever. And then you apply um, successively commutators with the Hamiltonian. And you think of this operator as basically being a vector in a Hilbert space of operators. And so you have basically the nth basis vector is essentially n times the commutator with the Hamiltonian. So you should think of this as being, of course, a representation of the nth, uh, nth term in the um, um, expansion of this exponential here. Now, what you do is then you orthonormalize these um, roughly n commutator things with respect to an inner product on the space of operators, which you can just take as the trace of, so the correlation function, if you want, between these two operators. And in the process of orthonormalizing these um, operators, um, you find a series of normalization coefficients, which you need to um, obviously find. Um, and those are called land source coefficients. And the conjecture by these people here is that a nice way of characterizing chaos and that makes connection to the OTOC is to ask how does the sequence of these land source coefficients grow as you increase little n. Um, and basically the growth rate is supposed to be asymptotically linear with a coefficient that is bounded below by the Lyapunov exponent. 
Um, so the saturation of this equality is supposed to be true for maximally chaotic systems, and this is also what we will establish in our systems. Okay, so this is, this is another way of quantifying other than the OTOC, basically this idea that in chaotic systems, um, what happens under Heisenberg evolution is that operators get bigger and bigger and increase in complexity. So, um, so because we're on the, so we're currently in the numerical part of this talk, I just wanted to use the opportunity to show you these results, which is basically a computation of the Lanzar sequence um, for um, the SYK model um, for a finite but large Hilbert space size. And what one can find here is that you have um, different um, regimes of the behavior of this curve. So you have some initial growth phase, okay, um, for which this is a phase for which analytical results have previously been available. But this gives then rise to a phase where you see a, um, a turnover and you see something like, um, well, I, I don't want to call it plateau phase because it's, it's a monotonically decreasing phase, but you see what I mean. The, um, the sequence saturates basically and then um, goes to zero in a characteristic way um, at an N which is of order of the size of the Hilbert space of operators. And this is to be compared with previous results which were in the thermodynamic limit where basically it was found that this land source sequence grows with a coefficient j which is related to this coupling, average coupling j that um, I introduced earlier. Julian, sorry, uh, what's the in axis? It's n, it's a number of commutations, am I right? Yes. Okay. Yes, so um, let me see. So n is um, basically, uh, so as I said, the, these, these coefficients themselves are basically what you need to do a Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization of the um, of these naive basis vectors, as as you said, the O n basis vector has to do with n times commutation with the Hamiltonian. Okay. Yeah, just small n is the number of the steps here. Just to yes, yes. Well, but but it's a little bit more complex than that because you you also normalize them. So so the actual basis vector O n contains contributions not just from n commutators, but also from smaller numbers of commutators. But that's maybe a detail. So roughly speaking, what you say is correct. Okay. And so um, what I want to say here is that if you take the thermodynamic limit, basically there is um, a close relation between this Lanzos or Krylov complexity and scrambling. But in a system where you can actually go to finite Hilbert space size, you see um, um, very much also rich dynamics post scrambling. And this plot that I'm showing here in some sense is an interesting target again, because it's similar in nature to this, to this idea of the spectral form factor, which behaves you know, in the thermodynamic limit, like you would expect the gravity dual for a while. And then it has these, uh, let's say, um, you know, quantum corrections or unitarizing corrections, which go beyond that classical regime. And so it would be an interesting target also, this kind of complexity um, to um, um, reproduce it from some bulk calculation. Okay, but now let me go um, to analytical results. Okay, so now uh, what, we've, what we've done is in some sense, we've given an illustration that these models are really um, so simple that you can solve them on a computer and you can get interesting results by just putting them on a computer. But then in some sense, the, for me at least, the interesting bit is to try and explore, to take these numerical results as an inspiration to explore things analytically. Okay, and so now, first of all, I want to give you an analytical um, argument um, that this SYK class of models actually satisfies ETH. And then I want to go further, talk about two dimensional CFTs, and I want to talk more about this idea of scrambling in eigenstates. Okay, so um, here, is a, uh, here is a rough summary of what's going on um, related to the properties of eigenstates in SYK-like systems. So the way that we approach this uh, analytically is that we split up um, the computation into essentially two different kinds of computations. We were um, looking at the Schwarzian sector, okay? And we were able to um, address the question of thermalization um, using something like um, 
a monogamy method in two dimensions. So I will actually explain that because in two dimensions also, and I will talk about this. And for those who are uh, connoisseurs of this, I mean, basically what we're doing is we're taking Liouville theory in two dimensions with brain boundary conditions and we're reducing them to an effect of Schwarzian theory. And using this, we can establish thermality of these eigenstates, okay? So that's one thing. I will say more, of course, about this. Then, however, in addition, <clears throat> in SYK, you also have a discrete tower of states, which in terms of the fundamental fermions, you can think of as being, um, well, these kind of uh, derivatives acting on fermions, and you can work out their conformal dimension, which are basically governed by some, um, by some anomalous dimension, epsilon n, that was computed by um, Rosenhaus and Polchinski and by, uh, by, by, um, by Stanford Maldacena and also by Gross and Rosenhaus, yeah. Um, and um, this discrete tower of states, we can also um, treat analytically and we can also establish that it satisfies ETH with a little disclaimer here that I will explain. So let's go actually just to this computation. So what we can say is that these ON, okay, so these ON are the, the, these, these kinds of operators, okay, um, they actually satisfy, um, um, they actually form um, a CFT, okay. And so what we can do here is that we can relate statements about ETH to uh, analytic statements about the OPE coefficients of this CFT. So the idea that you have a state that is created by an operator OM that's heavy and another state OM and you probe it with the third operator OK. Okay, this is just a three point correlation function of these O's and this gives us the OPE coefficients. Now these OPE coefficients are computable and they're computable because, as you see, they are related to certain six-point functions of the C operators. So what we're doing is we're using the, um, um, the, the, the analytical control over the six-point functions of the microscopic fermions to make conclusions about OPE coefficients in the CFT governing the O operators. Um, and, um, well, I have some, some backup slides if this interests you, but in the interest of time, I decided to focus on the result. And basically you find that these OPE coefficients give you some specific smooth functions here on the diagonal, plus entropically uh, suppressed off diagonals also with a specific computable smooth function. So they are, they actually satisfy um, the ETH ansatz. Um, the little disclaimer that I wanted to make, which is physically perhaps important is that um, the limit that we're taking is that all of these operators are somehow scale order one in the, in the um, let me call it central charge, so the number of degrees of freedom, um, but we take a hierarchical limit that N and M are much, much bigger than K. So these are sort of, we call the middleweight operators. And one can ask oneself whether one would have really expected those middleweight operators to behave like ETH operators. But what we find is we're simply that they do. So um, now in the Schwarzian sector, well, basically um, what you want to study is the soft mode, the contribution of the soft mode to um, these kind of correlation functions. And so I can write this here as this is some integral over a theory whose action is in fact the Schwarzian with a, with a um, suitable measure. And let me just say again, um, the upshot is that one can, can construct correlation functions with respect to this measure by starting in two-dimensional Liouville theory, um, giving certain boundary conditions. And the boundary conditions allow one to specify essentially the insertion of a pure state density matrix. And then taking the one-dimensional limit to construct expectation values with respect to this theory. So we take 2D boundary Liouville theory, we reduce it to effectively the Schwarzian path integral, um, which by the way, of course, was done before us, uh, but not, not in the context of uh, putting these states here by the Princeton group. So Lam, Mertens, Triachi, and Verlinde, that's LMTV here. And so again, our results are that here now without any disclaimers, basically the trace of some um, light operators with respect to a pure state density matrix is, um, is actually exponentially close to the trace with respect to the thermal density matrix as a, at a temperature that is a simple function of the properties of the pure state. 
plus these exponentially small corrections. So indeed, also analytically, we see that uh, these kind of models satisfy the thermality properties of their eigenstates if they are sufficiently highly excited. Okay, so um, now um, I think I have about maybe 10 minutes left. Um, let me go to um, um, higher dimensional um, um, cases. So, well, higher dimensional, one dimension higher, two dimensional CFT. But that's because I also want to highlight um, some new physical aspects. So, so far we've really, fo we've really focused on the thermal properties of operators. And now I would like to try and see if we can also talk about the scrambling properties of operators analytically with respect to eigenstates. So for this, let's go to our second holographic lamppost, which were the sparse spectrum CFT2s. And again here, um, the, this abbreviation stands for the authors Hartmann, Keller, and Stoica. So the, the sparse spectrum CFT is defined in the sense of HKS. So what one can do in two-dimensional CFT, we have in some sense already exploited this in our Schwarzian computations because we started in two-dimensional CFT in the first place, but now let's be more explicit about it. We can talk about eigenstates um, by inserting a primary operator um, at the origin using the um, operator state correspondence to prepare the CFT basically in an eigenstate on a cylinder and com compute expectation values of the type insert some operator Q that you're interested in between these two eigenstates. Okay, so these are of course the kind of uh, computations that we're interested in. Now, let me remind you of something very basic that we will get uh, back to in just a few minutes. So a very nice properties of CFT um, is that conformal correlators in some sense obey tensor transformation laws that in the sense that if you do a holomorphic change of coordinates, so the Z plane is mapped to the W plane, where W is a holomorphic function of Z, then if you know the correlation function, for example, on the Z plane, then you can construct it on the W plane simply by um, adding these Jacobians. So the derivative W primed to the power H1, where H1 obviously is the conformal dimension of the operator O that are inserted at C1 or W1 and so on. So there's a simple transformation law with just a bunch of Jacobians between correlation functions um, in different coordinates. But the interesting bit that I want to point out is that uh, as Cardi pointed out, you can use this in order to construct the thermal correlation function very simply. Because you can start with the um, CFT just on the plane where the correlator uh, decays algebraically, one over Z, Z12 to the power of the conformal dimension. And you apply this transformation, which obviously maps the plane to the strip where you have the line, so the infinite line, times the finite period beta. So this is periodic in imaginary time with period beta, which is of course what you expect for a thermal correlation function. And lo and behold, if you plug in this um, transformation law, you transform this simple algebraic correlation function into precisely the thermal two-point function of the CFT on the line. Um, however, uh, what's important here, this is of course a very elegant trick, but it's, um, it's just a trick where we take beta as an input. So this allows us to, set, to construct from a simple vacuum thing here, the thermal correlation function of the CFT on the line at arbitrary temperature beta. So this leads us to a strategy basically of how to generally, um, you know, establish thermality or thermal like results in these large CCFTs. So the idea is to construct um, somehow a map that is like the Cardi map, but um, that incorporates the effect of the heavy states, the heavy operators that create the states in such a way that I end up with a Cardi-like map with the only difference that this beta now is not an arbitrary parameter, but is an output of the process. So will be a property of this um, heavy state, okay? So the way that this is done is, and so now let's let's look at the general case. Let's let's just focus on the diagonal piece. So let's look at the case where we have insertions Q, which are somehow light, okay? But we have n l arbitrary number n l of them, and then let's have two more insertions which create the heavy states. 
And so schematically, the stress tensor here, or to be more precise, the semi-classical stress tensor at large C, it takes a form where you have a contribution due to the heavy states and then a perturbatively suppressed contribution due to the light operators here. And the idea is that you can actually undo the um, explicit uh, effect of the heavy operators by doing a partial uniformization transformation, which actually just means that you do a change of coordinates Z of W such that the new stress tensor, which obviously changes by the anomaly piece, is now proportional only to the light contribution, but evaluated in a new geometry W. Okay, so I say it again, I find some Z of W, or if you want W of Z, such that the new stress tensor only has light contributions. So I'm kind of squashing and twisting the, the geometry a little bit. And then there is some um, geometric Casimir contribution such that the new stress tensor is only given by the light contribution. And the goal is, of course, now to find for a general expression of this kind, the function Z of W and then argue that this gives us a thermal correlation function because it takes the Cardi form. In fact, this can be done. So this is something I did with Tarek Anus. Um, and um, what we can show is that essentially for a general uh, string of light operators, okay, such that the total contribution to the stress tensor here um, doesn't compete, so is perturbatively suppressed. Okay? So that's what it means to be light. So, but for a general number of light operators, we can show that um, these kind of correlation functions are approximated with exponential accuracy by the choice with respect to a canonical density matrix at temperature beta, where beta is implicitly given by this relation here. So it's just a function of the central charge and the dimension of the heavy operator. So I should have said the heavy operator that, that uh, creates the state E has dimension H. So um, there is an extremely important uh, uh, caveat here, which is that this is true really only for the case where you take the contribution of the Verasoro identity block, and it will be systematically uh, corrected by non-identity contributions. Now, um, what this means is that, okay, you can sort of um, write this more abstractly. You can say that the expectation values with respect to this pure state density matrix are up to exponential accuracy the same as the uh, averages with respect to a canonical density matrix at an effective temperature, but now for generic light insertions. So not just for one point functions of operators, but for two point, three point, four point functions of operators. And so the way that we uh, express this is that we say this 2D holographic sparse spectrum CFT satisfies an extended version of eigenstate thermalization. So on to what I think is a nice um, 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 illustration of what this extended notion of ETH might mean. So for example, now we can look at something like the out of time order correlation function of some probe operators with respect to heavy states. That's the kind of thing which um, we numerically studied in the SYK no, um, model and which I originally uh, uh, introduced with respect to the thermal state um, in the introductory part of this talk. So um, that means, of course, that in practice, we study a six-point function. Study a six-point function with two heavy operators and four light operators, where the four light operators are out of time order. And um, well, again, applying this partial uniformization uh, um, technique uh, that we describe in our paper, um, what you find is that you can massage this into a form where it's basically one minus some coefficient times um, one over n e to the lambda ht. Sorry, this should have been one over c, I apologize. Um, where lambda h is now obviously what we interpret as the Lyapunov exponent with respect to these eigenstates. And the computation reveals that the Lyapunov exponent is precisely what was conjectured by uh, actually Manuel and myself. Um, namely 2 pi over beta. So it's maximal with respect to the ETH temperature that we associate with this heavy eigenstate. And um, another nice sort of way that you math mathematically you can view this is that you can basically resum the, um, if you want, the graviton exchanges here 
into a single exchange of a mode which has a propagator that is e to the minus i alpha t where alpha is a pure imaginary number and this is what uh, what uh, what uh, Kitaev has called the scramblon and which we, we call sometimes the papillon because it is the butterfly effect, the particle that mediates the butterfly effect. But basically, essentially this is a single effective mode that mediates this chaotic growth here. Um, what is interesting, which I'd like to point out as well, is that this alpha is purely imaginary in the case that these states are heavy enough to create a thermal-like state. If they are actually not heavy enough to create a thermal state, then alpha is real, and what we have is instead of having a, um, you know, scrambling type behavior, we have actually an oscillatory behavior, which is very different from this chaotic behavior. And we um, we interpret this transition from alpha imaginary to alpha real as some kind of transition between an ergodic to a non-ergodic phase, where the non-ergodic phase is the one that has an oscillatory OTOC. Now. Um, what I haven't um, described in detail is that basically um, there is a nice mathematical framework to couch all of this, which is that you can measure whether the system, well, what is the alpha of the system and whether it is say in the ergodic or the non-ergodic phase by considering instead of an explicit computation, just effectively the monogamy of the operator insertions around the unit circle. And this monogamy can be brought into the form where it's twice the cosh of pi alpha. Um, and well, alpha can be, of course, it's, if it's imaginary, then you have a cosine here. Um, and basically, um, whether alpha is imaginary or real has to do with the fact which co-adjoint orbit um, the stress tensor lies on. This is diagnosed by this monogamy. And the nice thing is that a completely equivalent um, criterion exists if you talk about the IR limit of the SYK model, namely the Schwarzian model, where we can also define via this route of the Liouville theory, uh, a monogamy. And this monogamy also can be either on the parabolic, the um, hyperbolic or the elliptic orbit. And therefore there is also this, this transition between maximally scrambling and non-ergodic behaviors. So that means seems to mean that there is sort of like um, a nice uh, uh, phase transition between ergonic and non-ergonic behavior, which actually has to do with the parabolic orbit of the Virasoro, uh, uh, parabolic or, or orbit of Virasoro. And be interesting to see if this is some kind of universal description of an ergonic to non-ergonic crossover. Now I'm, I'm kind of running out of time. So um, let me just tell you um, to basically um, round out the tour of chaotic properties that I that I explored here is that actually similar ideas, meaning these sort of large large C spa spectrum ideas, actually also allow you to compute the Lantosh sequence uh, analytically. And so what one does there is one um, looks at basically again these two n commutators with the Hamiltonian. One can write them as the action of the Liouvillian superoperator. And so the Liouvillian superoperator to the power two n basically defines a moment mu to n. And then there is a recursive algorithm um, that uh, re recovers the land source sequence. Um, one computes basically these moments using our large C sparse spectrum techniques, then applies this uh, recursion relation, which is actually rather complicated, I must say, but it can be done. And one finds that as you can see here, for large n, this is precisely linear in n, so square root of n squared with a um, with an exponent here with this slope which precisely saturates this bound um, that um, Parker, Altman, Scafidi um, and I forget the final author proposed. So okay but the expectation you would have had based on the fact that these systems are maximally chaotic. But let me summarize. So um, Okay, so I gave you a tour of various results in SYK-like models and two-dimensional large spectrum sparse CFTs. Okay, so I think these are nice because they're solvable models of strongly correlated many body systems. So there's interesting chaotic and non-ergodic physics to be explored here. But they're of course also exciting because those things have at least some notion of a bulk dual. By some notion, of course, I'm referring to this um, notion to call uh, the Schwarzschild gravity sector. 
Now, um, basically, our results all fall into this uh, uh, category that correlations in individual eigenstates are exponentially close to thermal ones, and then there are non perturbative corrections. Okay? And we would like to call this scenario basically extended eigenstate thermalization. Now, there are extremely uh, interesting developments, of course, if you look at the subleading perturbative and non perturbative corrections in the central charge. So Tolia Dimarski has worked on this and also Alex Maloney and um, um, Shovik Datter, many people uh, haven't really been able to, to compare to this in this talk for uh, um, time reasons, obviously. Now, um, one of the results in, within this extended ETH that I want to uh, highlight specifically is that eigenstates scramble as fast as a thermal ensemble, and which has been pointed out by um, Jan de Boer and Kyriakos Papadodimos and Sagar Lohander and so on to be translatable into a statement about the black hole interior of typical states. So that's just one, ex that's just one um, illustration of how you can translate these things to bulk language. Um, we have talked about non-ergodic phases, oscillatory otox, and I've given you a little bit of a taste of um, uh, looking at um, complexity of operator growth directly rather than through this OTOC via this Krilov notion of uh, complexity growth. So the last uh, slide that I have is one that basically gives you, again, an overview of the timescales that we've been looking at. And so what I want to say is that there are basically universal notions here um, up until the scrambling time, which have to do with this Lyapunov type scrambling. And there are universal no notions here at time scales that are very large, larger than the Thales time, which have to do with universal spectral correlations. And what we've shown is that this extended ETH, which seems to be true in these holographic many body systems, actually link these two universal notions. And that's, I think, a conceptually very interesting uh, thing to explore further. So in view of time, let me not uh, drone on much longer. Let me just uh, thank you for your attention and uh, ask you for your questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Questions, please. We have some time. Five minutes. I'm good and I have some questions. Yes, please. Can you hear me? Yes, uh, okay, I can hear you so. Well. Uh, but we don't see. Can you show, uh, can you show the picture of growth of BN coefficients? I mean, the numerical one. So your statement is that it starts to decay after some. Of, uh, steps of, of, of n of order s, yes. Yes, and so what is in, so what happens after d square uh, after the point that tau, tau is zero? Uh, it's just zero. There, are all the the sequence is not defined after um, d squared, and that can be shown. So in, in continued, so in continued fractions, this means that it, it's like it terminates at some. It terminates point. exactly. That's exactly right. So. It, so it's like uh, you, you you found the exact um, the, so so it's, there is finite continued fraction expansion of the, of this case, right? And what's the interpretation of the spectral function? Because in that paper, uh, yes, go ahead. I ju is uh, so sorry, just start the question again, please, because you cut out for a second there. What is the interpretation? Um, in terms of spectral function, because linear growth, as I remember, linear, gro linear growth of BN coefficients is equivalent to exponential decay of spectral function, right? Yes. So what's the interpretation of such a decrease of BN coefficient? Um, so, sorry, by spectral function, you mean the correlation function? Um, as I remember, it's the uh, transform of, uh, of green function, right? Um, yes. yes, but but um, so I'm not aware of a link to the spectral function as such. I mean, just just so we're on the same page, spectral function is what I would call the imaginary part. Uh, say the imaginary part of the trace of the retarded I mean, in, function. In notation of the paper, it's like uh, for well, a transform of, of the correlation function. Exactly of the of the Whiteman function. Yeah, yeah. So, yes. so it's related. That... So it's related. So the so the. B, uh, so the two nth moment, which is related yeah, to yeah. all of the BNs, is the two nth derivative of the Whiteman function with respect to time evaluated at t is equal to zero. That's what that means. Yeah, and oh, okay. 
but but to try and ask you answer your question so i i don't know because i haven't studied it but my guess would be now now that you say it my guess would be that obviously the correlation function also has some um particular time evolution and as we know that it has characteristic features at various time scales and i would say that what happens initially is related to things that happen up to the scrambling time scale and then later on what you find is you know time scales like um the heisenberg time and i would say that you can probably see this as a particular feature but i'm, I'm not entirely sure here what time scale this would be because you see we shouldn't think of n as time n is just the steps um yeah yeah, 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 yeah. But I, 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 I agree with you that there should be there should be some feature that corresponds to this uh, hitting zero, um, in in this Whiteman function. I, I totally agree with that intuition. Yep. And what? And probably you can comment on what's the form. I mean, what is the form of a uh, wave function? Form of the. I mean. The form wave of the function. wave function. Yes. So you. So you're referring to the. Um, fact what, what, that what's the meaning of these higher corrections in the form? No, no, no you're ref you, I, so if I understand correctly, you're referring to the fact that you can also think of um, this dynamics of the Liouvillian as an effective quantum mechanics. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just like a summation. And you of, have uh, you have a propagation of some wave packet, and then yeah, uh, yeah. my intuitive understanding is that you want to think of this here as being some something like a dispersion relation for that wave package, and actually the velocity of propagation goes to zero here. Okay, and so this can be actually seen also numerically. So Adrian and Ruth have made uh, studies of this, and basically what you find is that the wave packet uh, propagates along this chain, if you want, out to further and further values of n, but it becomes more and more slow, um, and it becomes its 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 velocity eventually asymptotically goes to zero. But in fact, what happens is that there is also dispersion, and the wave package actually disperses disperses already along the entire length of the chain before it has fully slowed down. Um, but this is, anyway, this is another way of really encoding the same information yeah. as you see in this plot. But if that interests you, I think that maybe is a more technical discussion uh, that we could have uh, in private. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Thank you. So thank you for the question. More questions, please? We have time for one urgent question. Uh, can I ask about the uh, calculation of the uh, OTOC in the heavy state in the yes. ADS 352 con? Of course you can, yes. So you did this transformation uh, to the uh, region in which the, uh, you have only light contribution to the stress tensor, but Correct. I don't quite see what happens to the anomalous term. So if no, no, the, good. The anomalous term is precisely the key. So what, what happens is that the transformed stress tensor transforms like a tensor plus this anomalous bit. And we, the, the, the way to find this transformation Z of W is precisely the equation that the anomalous bit, which is the Schwarzschild derivative, uh, so okay, is the... equal to the heavy contribution okay, okay. with a minus sign. So it cancels out. Okay. And that's also the, see why I'm saying Casimir energy takes care of the heavy states because we can, we can interpret the, the anomalous contribution as the Casimir energy due to the new geometry. Right, right. Okay, okay yeah. That's, yeah. Thanks. Okay. If no more questions, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you very much for your very interesting talk. Yes, and we will go to the next speaker. Maybe we will can have one minute for technical break. Okay, okay thank you very much. I'll stop sharing. And um, okay, I guess I need, I need to leave, right? Because the other person yes, yes, come yes, host. Sure. Yeah, okay. okay, see you, bye.